Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to this podcast from Concordia Theological Seminary. I'm Dr. Charles Gieschen, and uh, we are focusing on the gospel lesson for Easter 7. We're coming to the, to, toward the end of the great 50 days of Easter. Uh, Pentecost uh, follows very quickly. So as we look at this uh, gospel lesson from John chapter 17, happens to be the latter part of some, something that's known often as the high priestly prayer. Uh, it's known as the high priestly prayer simply because of the understanding of a priest, uh, the priestly function of praying. And so Jesus has this prayer at the end of his farewell discourse in the Gospel of John. Another way to remember this is to simply understand it as the farewell prayer that caps off the farewell discourse that starts in chapter 13, verse 1, goes to the end of chapter 17. Uh, here, one can say it fits liturgically uh, in terms of the lectionary with the... Um, with the, the turn in the second half of the Easter season, namely, once we have Good Shepherd Sunday and Easter 4, the, the gospel lessons start pointing forward to Pentecost. So you have promises of the coming paraclete, of the Holy Spirit being sent. And this text nicely is fo focusing for us forward uh, what our Lord is praying about in terms of the future church. So it really is setting us up, one might say, for our celebration of Pentecost, which in a sense is the, 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 the capping off time of the great 50 days of Easter, and that starts the long season of Pentecost, where we focus on uh, the life of Christ in his church. Um, and so the, the, um, this text is a nice transition towards that. As uh, in... One other point in, before we get into the actual text is the farewell prayer really has three major parts. Uh, the first few verses, verses 1 to 5, focus on a prayer that Jesus is offering for himself. He's you know, praying to the Father and referring to what he will be doing, uh, especially as he, um, he glorifies the Father through offering himself as a sacrifice. Then he prays for his apostles, those that he is, is taught, those that he has revealed himself to, and their work as in, the, in the establishment of the, the church. And then the third part, which is the part we're looking at right here, verses 20 to 26, are spe is speaking about the future church that is going to be going to come about through the testimony of the apostles uh, to the world. So one might say, these verses specifically, verses 20 to 26, are speaking about you and me as the church, what Jesus is praying about, uh, our, uh, about us and about our future. So let's uh, now move then to these individual verses uh, and, and walk through them in the Greek text. Jesus starts off uh, in, in this third section talking about what he's asking for uh, as he prays to the Father. And so remember, these are words the Son is directing to the Father in prayer. And so he's saying, I'm asking not concerning these, and that's a reference back to the apostles. He's not just concerning these alone. So he certainly has prayed for himself, first five verses. He's prayed for the apostles, quite an extensive uh, thing about his, his followers, the, the, the 12. Now he's broadening that, but also he's uh, asking, he's requesting, he's praying concerning the ones who are believing, present tense participle there, through the account, the log, logu, the two logu, the, their account, namely the testimony, if you will, of the apostles concerning or to me. So he's praying for the future church. 
long before all of uh, us have come to, uh, to faith and to be part of the Holy Christian Church, uh, you have Jesus praying about the reality. And so one might say, as I said earlier, this is really a wonderful foreshadowing um, of, of Pentecost and all that would happen with the giving of the Spirit and with the, um, the growth of the church. Jesus is already praying uh, for those who would come to faith through the gospel that uh, would go forth from the apostles. And then you have, uh, in this section, a lot of hinna clauses. Now, several of them are purpose, but not all of them. Uh, you have a combination of oftentimes two or three. Uh, here you actually have in this sentence three hinna clauses. The first two, I would say, are expressing purpose, and the third one, uh, as when we get to it, is expressing more of the result of those things being accomplished. So you have here your purpose. Whenever you have hina, you always are having these subjunctive verbs. Here you have the verb I, me, to be. So in, here's the purpose of, um, uh, that he is praying um, for the future of the church. What, what is the purpose that he, for which he's praying? That all are one, and you see how often this theme of oneness comes up. Uh, several times it's introduced already in chapter 1, um, or excuse me, chapter 10, where it's speaking about the one flock, one shepherd. Uh, Jesus is, is uh, and that's a uh, uh, text that often comes up, obviously, on the fourth Sunday of Easter. Uh, but that theme comes back in to Jesus' teaching right here in the high priestly prayer, that they all be one. And whenever we hear that oneness, we're thinking of the oneness of God is the the foil from which we understand our oneness as the church. The oneness that we see at, with the three persons who are the one God. There's only one God. The unity of God is certainly emphasized with that language of oneness. Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema, Behold, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And that's really, I would say, part of the the key background for this kind of teaching, that all be one just as you, Father, and again, Jesus, this is the Son, addressing the Father in prayer. It's an inner Trinitarian dialogue that's being recorded in this prayer. Uh, one might say, if you wanted to, to uh, wonder how did John get this, uh, John, I think, of all of the apostles was especially interested in Jesus teaching the last night before his death. And one might say it's sort of like his last will and testament. Exegetes have often said this. Uh, John 13 through 17 is sort of like J Jesus' last will and testament. And this prayer kind of caps it all off. And how important are those that, 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 that testament that people give at the end of their life or that they leave for their relatives to read. Uh, and, and this is really, one might say, the, the heart of, of Jesus being expressed to the Father about his future church. So in order that you, Father, be in me, again, the oneness of the Trinity, uh, this is setting up not only Pentecost, but Trinity Sunday, which follows uh, in two weeks, uh, that, they, that I also be in you. So this, uh, this close intimacy of the Trinity is the basis for all of them being one. Uh, and then you have, in order that, again, expressing the purpose, in order that they be in us, so here you have your verb, that they be in us, and then I would argue this third hinna clause is more of the result. The result of all being one, namely um, uh, the, the, them being in, um, in Christ, in the Father, uh, in the Holy Trinity, is so that the world believes so you have hina plus the subjunctive verb in order that this happen in the future, that the cosmos, 
the, the universal scope of the mission of the church is emphasized here. What a beautiful fore, uh, foreshadowing of, of the Pentecost emphasis. God gives his spirit to the church. Why? So that, that's, so that the church may witness to the world of what Christ has done for all of the world. Very wide universal scope. We're not just concerned about a few people coming to faith uh, uh, or somehow just concerned about the elect, uh, as sometimes in the, the, the Reformed theology. We're concerned about the whole world believing. The, Christ says, God has loved the world and given his Son, who has atoned for the sins of the whole world. Universal justification. So the, the concern is, the, the result is that we would, uh, the desire of the Son is that the world believe, not just some, but, uh, but the world. That, and what do they want to, what is uh, that he want them to believe? That you sent me. This is a loaded term. I sometimes refer to this as apostolic um, Christology. So you have this understanding of Jesus as the sent one. Implied here is everything from his incarnation to his death and resurrection. He is the one whom the Father has sent to, to testify to the Father and finally to accomplish the will of the Father by offering himself as a sacrifice for the sins. So when it's not just a matter of when you, you see that phrase, believing that you sent me, all that's important is to say, oh, Jesus is representing the Father. No, it's to believe all that, that, uh, that uh, uh, who Jesus is and what he has done. So all, it's all implied with this language of um, believe that you sent me, uh, that Jesus is, um, uh, uh, and to know Jesus is to know the Father. To see Jesus is to see the Father. To hear Jesus is to hear the Father. Because the Father and the Son are both Yahweh. And we know Yahweh in the Son. Um, we come to the Father through the Son. All of that's implied there. Verse 22. You have this language of glory. Keep in mind the Old Testament. Uh, and here's where your... your um, you have the perfect tense verb here. Uh, so the emphasis, and I, um, uh, and the glory uh, you have here, which you have given to me, I have given, here again the perfect tense verb, to them. And think about the Old Testament. Jesus shares in the very glory of the Father. He is the face of the Father towards uh, creation. The Son is, is, in the Old Testament one might say, the, the glory or the kavoth, the weightiness of God. So the glory which you have given to me, namely which the Father has given to the Son, the Son says, I have given, ready, perfect tense, to them. Uh, some background for that in Paul would be 2 Corinthians 3 as well as 2 Corinthians 4. There Paul talks about how when we behold the glory, we are being transformed into that glory. Namely, we are sharing in that glory. And here uh, one might say it's speaking of... Um, uh, another way that we might talk about it in Lutheran circles is we share now in the righteousness of Christ. We share in, in this gift of him giving that which we don't have by nature because of our fallen sinfulness. Uh, think about how Paul talks about how uh, through the fall, Adam and Eve lost the glory of God. Well, now that's being restored to us through um, uh, Christ, uh, who has come and revealed it, and now as we believe in him, he gives to us, he gives to all who believe, his glory. So a wonder, wonderful testimony, and that glory is fully restored in us, obviously, on the last day, through the resurrection. Then you have the purpose clause, hina, and whenever you have purpose, think of the subjunctive hina, um, uh, whenever you have the hina, you're expecting the subjunctive verb right there from I, me. So in order that 
that uh, uh, you, um, just a minute, you have in the end of verse 22, uh, in order that they, hey mice, right here, uh, hey mice, in order that they be one, just as, um, uh, as, as we are one, in the sense of that there is a unity. Remember, we had this introduced already here in verse 21. Here it's simply restated. Uh, they share in the glory of God, thus there is this oneness uh, we have been baptized into Christ. We have been joined with the Trinity because his name has been placed upon us. And so there is this oneness, not that we have to somehow seek out. Uh, here again is where that comes through. In order that, um, that uh, they be one just as uh, we are one. So in order that they be one just as we are one. Uh, a wonderful statement in terms of what is accomplished when we are joined to God. We are joined also uh, to one another, and there is a unity that is brought about by being virtue of joined to the one God. Verse 23 continues this by speaking of this fact of, of being joined to God. I in them, here, this uh, background for this language can be seen, in, for example, in John 15, uh, where you have abiding in him and he in us. I think this is the background for this can be uh, preached and proclaimed a lot through baptism, of being joined or being in Christ, as well as Christ then being in us. So I in them and you in me. And again, the second hint of clause. Uh, in order that um, they be here, um, sometimes it's translated perfected. Uh, may it's tell us really has to do with with the um, uh, the end or or completion. And so here you have the perfect tense participle. Uh, in order that uh, they be completely one uh, here, with the result. That, and again, the same kind of result that was brought up here in this Hina clause is reinforced in this Hina clause. In order that the world know, here's your subject in the nominative, here's your verb, and then in order that the, or with the result, one might say, with the result, because of this union with, um, with God, what is that going to cause for the testimony to the world? It'll cause then the world to see uh, that and hear that from us, and then the world will know. Again, there is a lot of um, uh, uh, synonymy between the, the, the idea of knowing and believing. So here, in order that the world know, namely that the world believe, that you sent me. Again, the same idea that we saw just up here, we see it again here. It's not just a matter of that the, that the Father sent the Son into the world. But the Father sent the Son is implying all that he is doing, especially climaxing with his death and resurrection. And the resurrection is something we are continuing to proclaim uh, now as we come to the, to the end of these 50 days of Easter with this uh, Easter 7 text. And not only that you sent me, but that you love them just as you have loved me. So the, um, the emphasis is, this, this loving that goes on within the father-son relationship is a loving not limited to that relationship, but is extended through the son to the love of the, of the father for the whole world. God so loved, remember the same verb, agapao, uh, is used in John 3.16. Then, continuing the prayer, Jesus again addresses God, uh, addresses uh, his father with pater. Uh, you think of the importance of this in the Our Father. Again, that's reinforced in this prayer. Uh, you saw it a little bit earlier in verse 21. Here again in verse 24, he addresses God as Father. Uh, father, what you or whom you have given to me, I am desiring hina, 
Again, another one of those henna clauses, and you're going to see the subjunctive verb following, uh, that where I am, that these also be with me. So, namely, these be with me where I am. And here, obviously, Jesus is pointing forward that his ultimate prayer is that the church, once the church militant has, has, uh, has uh, finished its work, that they be with Christ where he will be, namely in glory, in everlasting life, in restored creation. Obviously, this, uh, the focus of this is, is, um, uh, will be experienced in fullness on the last day. But it's pointing forward. Jesus is already thinking about this about people being met emu with him. Uh, and then the next henna clause, with the result, this can be seen as when they are with him, what's the result of that that's going to happen? They're going to behold uh, his glory. Okay, they're going to see him for all he is. We beheld uh, uh, the, the death of Jesus as the ultimate revelation on earth. Um, in the sense of really seeing what God's all about. He shows it to, to us in, in, um, in the Son giving himself for us. But uh, there will be this sense of, of beholding no longer God veiled, but beholding him unveiled. Uh, so we will behold his glory. In order to behold my glory, Jesus says, which you have given to me. Here is talking about the mystery of the Son uh, being given the glory, uh, being given, uh, sharing in the, 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 uh, the being of God from eternity, which you have given to me because you loved me when? Before the foundation of the world. And obviously, this ties right back into John 1, where the Logos existed from eternity, and then um, all things came to be through him. So Jesus, uh, as the eternal Son, has uh, shared in the, the glory of the Father. And it was, that was given to him uh, from eternity. Uh, again, this is just a language to testify to the mystery of the eternity, the eternal generation of the Son. It certainly is a mystery, but some of this language is just testifying to that mystery. Not explaining it, but testifying to it. And then finally, this verse this, um, this, um, is capped off in these last two verses, this part of the prayer, where you again have Jesus addressing, the Son addressing God as, or addressing the Father, but here you have an adjective added. Righteous Father. Um, here I would just say, even though it's not as prominent in, in John, the language of the Father as, um, or, or the, the theme of righteousness is nevertheless there. Um, and you see it uh, in the description of, uh, of, um, of Jesus occasionally, especially when he's talking about the paraclete. Here, uh, the Father is righteous. He's the source of righteousness. Jesus calls him uh, righteous Father, um, uh, the world, here again speaking specifically of the fallen world, the world that we want to testify so that the world may know, may believe, but here it's understanding the world is in the fallen world, does not know, namely is not believing in Jesus, uh, does not know you, um, but I am knowing you, so the Father knows the Son, and is testifying to the, the Father. Excuse me, the, the Son knows the Father and is testifying to the Father. And these, namely the apostles, as well as those who will come to faith through the testimony of the apostles, they know uh, that you sent me. Here's the subject, the Father sent me. Again, we see that hap three times. We see it here, we see it earlier here, and we see it happening here, that same verb. Jesus is the sent one. It's that apostolic Christology. And whenever it's talking about sending, it's always including this understanding. He's sending, 
living, dying, rising again, his whole earthly work, not just his incarnation. Then verse 26, and uh, you have this, um, this uh, language of the name coming up. Uh, first person singular, I have made known to them, namely to the apostles and now to the wider church that are, are believing in, 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 um, through their testimony, I have made to them, known to them, your name. Namely, people now know who Yahweh is because they come to know Yahweh in the Son. The Son is Yahweh in flesh. So I've made known who, um, they made known the Father's name, Yahweh, uh, and, and, uh, and I will make it known also in the future. So through the testimony of faithful pastors, not just the 12 apostles, uh, people will continue to, to have known that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Yahweh. Just as Thomas confessed him in the Easter season, my Lord and my God. And why? Again, another Hina clause, forgot to highlight that one. We've seen a lot of them here in, uh, in order that the love with which you have loved me, that love that you have, see in the Father and the Son, be in them, in that language of, of, of the Father, of the Son being in them, is just uh, reinforced here uh, with this emphasis of the love with which you have loved me, be in them, and I also be in them. So the emphasis is, obviously, Christ is living in us, being joined to us through holy baptism, and so we have his love in us. That is a foundation then for our testimony to Christ, to who he is and to what he has done, the great love of the Father that, that has been shown forth in the giving of the Son for the life of the world. Again, all of this is a wonderful um, uh, uh, testimony to this whole Easter reality, resurrection reality, as well as setting up Pentecost as the church is equipped with the Spirit to now testify to Christ and all of his saving work and his ongoing work in and through us to share the love of God with the world. May the Lord bless your proclamation of this wonderful text uh, in this joyous Easter season.